Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the final session of our 2020 ICP Tips and Tricks webinar series. Just a note, if you miss, missed any of our ICP Tips and Tricks series, all of our previous webinar sessions are currently available for on-demand viewing. A complete webinar listing with registration links is available as one of your downloads within the handout section of the control panel. Today, we will learn a few tips and tricks to overcome problems associated with the analysis of cannabis samples by ICPMS. We will hear from four presenters, each presentation lasting approximately 15 to 20 minutes. There will be a 15 minute question and answer segment at the end. You can ask questions at any point via the chat window. Any questions we do not get a chance to address live will be answered and made available with the on-demand recording of today's webinar. Just a reminder, portions of this webinar have been pre-recorded. Computer audio is only available for these recordings and is the recommended option for attending this webinar. Lastly, at the close of the webinar, there will be a very short survey, just one question. Please take the time to respond as it will help us determine which topics to discuss in our 2021 webinar series. There is supplemental information provided by each presenting company that is available for download from the handout section in the control panel. Just a quick note on how to access the handouts. The handouts are available via the GoToWebinar control panel. Simply click the drop down arrow of the handout screen, then click the name of each handout to begin downloading. Now, with that out of the way, I'd like to briefly introduce each of our speakers for today's webinar. We will first hear from Bob Lockerman, Global Product Manager for CEM Corporation. Bob graduated from the University of New Hampshire with a Bachelor of Science degree in Analytical Chemistry. Upon graduation, he worked as a bench chemist for a commercial testing lab in Massachusetts. After three years, he joined the team at CEM to develop the world's first microwave digestion system and supported these systems and applications in the field before becoming the global product manager for the analytical division. Bob will cover tips for transferring samples into the vessel along with highlighting microwave digestion procedures for several different types of cannabis samples. Following Bob's presentation, we'll hear from Justin Massone, product manager for Glass Expansion. Prior to joining Glass Expansion, Justin worked as a technical sales representative for microwave digestion at Anton Parr, as well as a senior product specialist in the elemental spectroscopy group at Shimadzu. Justin received his bachelor's degree in chemistry from Johns Hopkins University. Today, Justin will focus on improving washout of troublesome analytes such as mercury, highlight accessories to help deal with high acid concentrations, and briefly review nebulizer maintenance and troubleshooting techniques. Following Justin, we will hear from John Peters, product manager at Shimadzu Scientific Instruments, John has 15 years of experience with marketing and analytical instrumentation and has worked extensively with ICP, OES, ICPMS, atomic absorption, TOC, as well as XRF and XRD instrumentation. John has worked in several industries, including sample introductions for spectroscopy and pharmaceutical manufacturing. Today, John will discuss various tips and tricks to optimize sample preparation and analysis parameters, including selection of internal standards, selection of isotopes to avoid, common isobaric interferences, avoidance of polyatomic interferences, sample introduction hardware tricks, and various software parameters to achieve optimum efficiency and accuracy. Lastly, today we'll hear from Robert Thomas, Principal of Scientific Solutions. Rob earned a degree in analytical chemistry from the University of Wales, UK, and has worked in the field of atomic and mass spectroscopy for more than 45 years. Rob has served on the American Chemical Society Committee and Analytical Reagents for the past 20 years as a leader of the Plasma Spectrochemistry Heavy Metals Task Force, where he has worked very closely with the United States Pharmacopeia to align ACS heavy metal testing procedures with pharmaceutical guidelines. Rob has written over 100 scientific publications is the editor of the Atomic Perspectives column in Spectroscopy Magazine, and has authored three textbooks on ICPMS. In 2018, Rob completed his fourth book entitled Measuring Elemental Impurities in Pharmaceuticals, and just this past month released his fifth book, Measuring Heavy Metal Contaminants in Cannabis and Hemp. Today, 
Rob will discuss how the cannabis industry can learn a great deal from the pharmaceutical industry with regards to regulating heavy metals and cannabis. Not only understanding the many potential sources of heavy metal contamination, but also how the final cannabis products can be contaminated by the manufacturing equipment, the extraction process, and the delivery systems used. Rob will also detail the issues stemming from a lack of federal oversight and why it is critical to have consistency across state lines in order for consumers to know they are using products which are safe to use. And now I will pass things over to Bob at CEM. Thank you very much. And I want to thank the audience for attending the webinar. What I plan to discuss today is to how to prepare a wide variety of cannabis enhanced sample types in a single batch. As part of that, I will cover sampling, some tips on how to get problem samples to the bottom of your vessel, uh, acid mixtures, and heating programs so that you can successfully digest these varied sample types and they're ready for dilution and then analysis. Well, before I get started on that, let me give you a little bit of background on CEM. CEM was established in 1978, and that makes us the oldest and largest microwave sample preparation company in the world. We're headquartered in Matthews, North Carolina, which is just outside of Charlotte, and we have six global subsidiaries and over 60 dealers worldwide to carry our product on. This is what our global headquarters looks like, as I mentioned, just outside of Charlotte. And then, of course, we also have plenty of people out in the field, whether they're the technical field sales reps or field service reps, to take care of you in your location. So as you can see, they're scattered widely about the United States in order to help you uh, look at equipment or prepare equipment. This is our Applications Associate Group, and our application staff is ready to help you with any sample preparation needs or any problems you might be having with your equipment uh, that, as far as the analysis or as far as the uh, application goes. So why do people consider microdigestion in general? And the key thing is the higher temperatures and pressures are much better for digestion. They give you much more complete digestions. So an example is if you're doing nitric acid on a hot block or atmospheric, you're only going to be at 120 degrees C. Whereas in the microwave, we can go anywhere between 180 to 210 for these set type samples, and we can actually go to 300 degrees C for certain samples. Uh, luckily, these types don't need that. It's much higher throughput than a hot block typically, because you can digest 24 samples in a 45 minute span, including cool down and you could have a second set of 24 ready to go right behind that. Uh, the single acid addition, so a lot of times on the hot plate, hot block, you have to do multiple acid additions because you're boiling away your acid. With this one, you do a single acid addition, only at the beginning of the operation. And you use much less acid as compared to a hot block because, again, it's not boiling away. It's sealed. Because it's sealed, the closed vessel retains the volatile elements and basically pre-programmed methods, which we'll show you, that are built into the system. There's actually a method named cannabis. Make it very simple. You choose it and press start. This is the microdigestion equipment that we use for the study that I'm going to be talking about today. And it is the Mars 6, uh, which is the newest uh, uh, product from CEM Corporation. It has the pre-programmed methods, as I mentioned. Very precise, precise temperature sensors uh, built into the floor, which we'll show you that in a minute here. And it has turntable and vessel detect sensors. And that's important because it knows how many vessels are in there. It knows exactly how much power to apply. And that's unique to CEM. The Mars Express Plus vessel we're going to use today is a rugged 110 ml TFM vessel. It basically has a 24 sample batch capacity and a very simple uh, to assemble three piece design. These are the sensors I was mentioning earlier and you can see the red line is pointing to the temperature sensors which sit right in the bottom, one on the inner row of the, of the, of the turntable, one on the outer row and they're very close in contact when the vessels run across them so to speak as they're traveling in a circle. The other ones are for vessel counting and recognition. We're going to recognize the type of vessel you're using so that we make sure you cannot put temperatures and pressure conditions that would not be suitable for those type of vessels. And then vessel counting, as I mentioned, we know exactly how many samples you're running. We know exactly how much power. And these are unique features to the CEM systems. So as I call it, we call this the Mars 6 Advantage. And this is how you can use the Mars 6 to your advantage. Cannabis slash testing labs and hemp testing labs uh, all receive different types of samples on a routine basis. It's not just always one type. Um, and in the past, 
you would have to do micro, if you do micro digestion, you couldn't batch these samples. You had to kind of group them. So plant materials together, edibles, oils, creams and lotions. You pretty much had to batch them in, in, in their own uh, single batch, so to speak, because they heat, heat so differently and they're made up of, uh, you know, their, their consistency is very different. So that meant lots of digestion runs. And that's not a very efficient way to prepare samples. But with the Mars 6 and the high precision and control of temperature and our robust uh, high pressure, high throughput vessel, we now can run all these different types in a single batch. And I'll be showing you a picture of that to show you how different the samples are. And uh, basically that means that you've got high throughput at 24 samples per 45 minutes, high efficiency because you're running all your sample types together. It's fast. So now you've got 40, as I mentioned, 45 minutes. And because of all those, you get a lower cost per test, which is what every laboratory is looking for. These are the, the varied samples, 11 of them. Um, so this is some work that, 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 that we did a little pre a bit previously, but this was uh, to show that you could do things with high proteins, high fats, and high carbohydrates, and all together in a single run. And again, that's what makes this special. Temperatures required to completely digest cannabis materials. Well, plant tissues, the, the flour, anything uh, like that, um, they're really easy to digest, and you're going to be able to get those in at 180. And if you were just running pure plant material and whatnot, we'd have you run there because the lower the temperatures you run, uh, the easier it is on the vessel and the longer vessel life you have, so to speak. Edibles can be anywhere between 180 to 210. The higher in fats, the higher the temperature that needed to break it down. Um, oils, which oil is essentially fat, that's your uh, 210 degrees C as well, so your, your crudes and whatnot and distillates. And then your tinctures are going to require between 200 and 210, depending upon the makeup. And these are just some of the samples, but give you, give you a wide range of different samples versus temperature. When we digest all these samples together, we'll take the entire batch to 210. That way they all go in solution. You need to get these vessels hot enough to digest all the organic material. You don't want to have any colored liquid when you, when you finish. Here's an example. On the left is a completely digested, clean, clear, colorless, particle-free digest, and that's what we want. On the right, we actually ran a material at a lower temperature at 180 degrees uh, for doing a, a, a food type sample, and we've got yellow material, and that's organics, and that can actually um, be a problem for the analysis and the analyzer, and uh, you know, uh, I'm sure that uh, Shimazu can talk more about that later, but again, we want to provide with a clear, colorless liquid ready to go uh, into the analyzer. Now some samples actually pose a problem with getting themselves into the vessel. If you have a powdery type material, uh, it will have it as staticky. Teflon is also staticky, so it will try to grab onto the side. You want your sample to be at the bottom in the acid, not on the side where maybe it can cause issues with the fact it's a microbe absorber. So also there's some sticky samples like peanut butter or honey. Uh, how do you get those to the bottom? We're actually going to show you a tip for that in a, in a, in a video here in a minute. Some samples require grinding, like hard candies, to get an appropriate sample size. And here's some of the solutions that we have for these different types. So the first one we have is an anti-static ionizer, and that's available from CEM. It's also available from other vendors. Uh, it works instantaneously. You just simply place your sample and wave your vessel in front of it, vessel liner, so to speak, and then you can, pour, you can put your stuff straight down into the liner and it won't grab onto the side anymore. We use ceramic scissors to cut samples to reduce sample size. A lot of these samples, uh, gummies and whatnot, are several grams. We typically work with a half a gram. Uh, that's a good sample size. It also meets California requirements. Uh, we don't want to use metallic scissors. Metallic scissors are going to uh, give, give contamination issues, or, or could. You don't want to put anything in there that's going to possibly be a contaminant, and that's one of them. And then Teflon, spatula, and cellulose filter paper to get a sample to the bottom. Again, let's not use metal uh, for this. Teflon coat is fine, or Teflon itself, but not, not pure metal. And we're going to take a look at how to do this right now. Hi, I'm Macy Harris, and I'm with CEM's analytical application group. Today I'm going to show you how to weigh a sticky sample onto cellulose filter paper. The reason we use cellulose filter paper is to make sure that we get our sticky sample all the way to the bottom without touching the sides. And this is an easy way to do that. To start, I'm going to use honey to show you how to complete this test. I'm going to take my small cellulose filter paper, place it onto my balance, tear it. While that's doing its thing, we're going to put it into our pipette.
Now that I have it in my pipette, I'm going to just simply squeeze it onto my white paper. Just like that. Once it's weighed onto there, I fold it into very small pieces so that it's now ready to go into my vessel. Just like that. Thank you, Macy. Now, um, another good option if you want to get a more homogenous sample of things like, uh, I say, gummy bears, sticky things, um, you can grind them. You basically can, you can grind multiple pieces rather than cutting. And basically, that will give you a better sample size, a better option for a homogenous sample. And again, softer materials will not grind without being frozen first. So this is a freezer mill that we actually use in our lab to repair those kind of samples. Well, we've got the sample in the bottom of the vessel. That's a good thing. So now we want to add the acid. The preferable acid combination is actually 9 to 1 nitric to HCl. Uh, you don't want to do much more HCl because the more HCl, the less oxidizing acid you have. You need the oxidizing part of the nitric in order to completely digest the samples so they go clean and clear. But the HCl really helps because it will help stabilize certain elements that don't like to stabilize for a long period of time in nitric acid. So 9 to 1 has become a very popular acid combination uh, because it will completely digest your samples and at the same time stabilize them for when you're ready for analysis. With the high temperatures that we achieve for nitric acid, use 210 for an example, there's really no need for an additional oxidizing agent like peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide works fine, but it also means you've got a reagent that might have a contamination or a contaminant. So if you only use one reagent, you only have to worry about the contamination for that nitric acid or nitric hydrochloric, I guess, for using two reagents. So we'll use a half gram sample size for all the work that we do, again, to stay in compliance with California rules, and we'll be using 10 mils of this acid mixture. So finally, we'll seal the vessel, and then we'll choose a method. The nice thing is we have one-touch methods, which are pre-programmed methods. So all we'd have to do is grab onto the, the, the cannabis method and load it, so to speak, by pressing on it and press start. So basically, it's as simple as that. We don't have to worry about programming. Just run the cannabis method. So when we did that, we noticed that it, we, as we are in the hold, so we'll, we'll ramp. This, 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 this system will automatically ramp the temperature to 210. It will then hold it there. And notice that bar graph is showing you the temperatures of every single sample that's being digested. Notice that they're all at 210, and a few of them are actually sliding a little bit higher in order to get the rest of the samples to 210. But that's okay. You can't over-digest. Uh, they're not going to go anywhere. So if you're at 215 or 220, it's not going to matter. You're going to get the digestion you want. That's the important thing. You need the temperature to be there in order to get total digestion of the, the organic matrix, which is what we showed before. And when you do that and you dilute them up, that's what all these beautiful samples look like then. You don't have any yellow color. You don't have any material around. Um, it, it's not viscous. It is diluted and it's ready to go for analysis. So the conclusions on, on, on our part of the uh, webinar today is that the Mars 6 with I-Wave temperature control and, and with the temperature control was able to digest 11 very different samples, we say, in duplicate along with a duplicate bank, blank, excuse me, in under 45 minutes, including cool down. The Express Plus vessel is simple to use, and that makes, again, the process very easy. Three parts to put together and assemble, that's it. The robustness of that vessel, though, even though it's so simple to use, it's robust enough to allow you to run up to 24 samples per batch of all those mixed samples. And for the work we did previously, the samples were diluted and then analyzed by the Shimazu ICPMS 2030 system. I'm not sure if that's what they'll be speaking about today uh, on this actual, these actual samples, but the work that was done for this earlier on was analyzed by Shimazu, and we thank them for that. And I thank you very much for your attention overall. And with that, I'll, I'll uh, send it back over and uh, we can continue on. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Bob. Just want to remind anyone, everyone that if you have a question for Bob, please uh, post that by your chat window. And again, we will get back to all of your questions at the conclusion of all four presentations. And now I'm gonna pass things over to Justin. Thank you, Ryan. And thanks again to everyone for joining us today. As Ryan already said in his introduction, today we will be discussing the common problems associated with the analysis of cannabis samples and offering solutions and recommendations to help optimize the performance of your ICPMS. 
Much of the information that will be presented today is discussed in much greater detail throughout our entire webinar series. If you would like more information, or if you have missed any of our ICP Tips and Tricks series, a complete listing of the available on-demand webinars, along with the registration URL, can be found in the ICP Tips and Tricks webinar registration flyer available in the handouts frame. Over the last few years, we have interacted and consulted with many labs performing the elemental analysis of cannabis samples by ICPMS. The problems and hurdles that are encountered with these sample types are actually quite common among all of these labs, such as a high final acid concentration, typically seen between 5 and 10%, silicate particulates present in the final samples as a result of non-HF digestions, contamination from the laboratory environment, frequently blocked nebulizers and a need for improved nebulizer maintenance protocols, improper cone selection and a need for improved cone maintenance protocols, a need for increased sample throughput, and long rinse times or mercury carryover. We will briefly address each of these issues today. However, for much more detailed information, we encourage you to watch the appropriate on-demand webinars. A final acid concentration of around 1 to 2 percent is typically re recommended for ICPMS. If concentration increases, there can be several consequences, such as decreased lifetime of the sample introduction components, a decrease in transport efficiency, and an increase in spectral or physical interferences. If dilution below 5 to 10 percent is not an option, this doesn't mean that the samples can't be analyzed by ICPMS, but rather that there will be a, simply be a need for increased maintenance and preventative actions as a result of the aggressive nature of the sample matrix. This will be discussed in greater depth in connection to nebulizer and cone selection and maintenance. Just a quick note on how to calculate final acid concentrations, as this can often be a source of confusion. For example, if a solution is labeled as 1% nitric acid, what does this actually mean? If we simply take one milliliter of 70% concentrated nitric acid and dilute to a volume of 100 milliliters, then this is 1% nitric acid in terms of volume percent where the use of 70% concentrated nitric acid is understood. Likewise, if a 1% hydrochloric acid solution is required, we still simply take one milliliter of concentrated hydrochloric acid and dilute to a volume of 100 milliliters, and the use of 37% concentrated hydrochloric acid is understood. Due to the nature of the samples being analyzed, silica particulates are often present in the final digest. The use of HF is generally avoided as a complete digestion is not necessary for the required analytes. Now, even though these particulates typically settle at the bottom of the vessel or sample tube, it is still highly recommended to filter all samples. While this can be time consuming, a lodged particulate can at best cause an interrupted run and at worst become irreversibly lodged in the nebulizer. While the use of the Guardian inline sample filter is encouraged with any samples that may contain particulates, the purpose of the inline filter is primarily to prevent damage to the nebulizer or other sample introduction components. It is not a replacement for proper sample preparation. John Peters of Shimazu will cover sample filtration in greater detail. Environmental contamination, meaning contamination from the laboratory environment itself, is another common problem. Typically, it is recommended that an ICPMS be kept in a clean room environment with appropriate air filtration. However, this is not always feasible and extra precautions must be taken to minimize the risk of contamination from an outside source, such as dust particles in the air or particulates dropping from the ceiling. While we have not yet encountered a cannabis lab where environmental contamination has affected results of the common heavy metals analyses, such as high blank values or failed QCs, we have heard from several labs where unknown particulates are becoming lodged in the capillary tubing or nebulizer, such as is seen in this image here, which was found in the capillary tubing of an internal standard mixing tea that was sent to us for evaluation. To mitigate external sources of contamination, glass expansion offers the wind tunnel auto sampler enclosure. The wind tunnel, suitable for most auto sampler models, protects samples against airborne contaminants, as well as protecting the operator against fumes and odors. The optional fan, HEPA filter, and exhaust port allow you to configure the wind tunnel to best suit your requirements. Now, let's take a look at how to diagnose and prevent the nebulizer issues that are most encountered in cannabis laboratories. Before getting into maintenance procedures, let's discuss how you can identify issues with your nebulizer to help reduce troubleshooting time on unrelated ICP components. Most ICP instruments have a software feature that can monitor nebulizer back pressure. It is good practice to record or take note of the nebulizer back pressure after your instrument has warmed up. 
This way your analyst can easily identify whether the back pressure is abnormally high or low. Glass expansion direct connect or DC concentric nebulizers run optimally at approximately 40 PSI. If you observe a low nebulizer back pressure and a loss in sensitivity, check the argon nebulizer gas contection at the instrument and at the nebulizer gas arm. PVC or other polymer tubes that are often used for the nebulizer gas supply can harden over time and lose their flexible gas tight grip. Even a 1% loss of argon can produce changes of several percent in many analytes. If a high nebulizer back pressure is observed, you likely have a partially blocked or clogged nebulizer. In addition to monitoring your nebulizer black pressure, your laboratory can also record your normal sample uptake rate to ensure that you're using the same sample uptake rate from day to day. A blocked nebulizer can also be identified by a decrease in your sample uptake rate. Lastly, in high throughput labs, and especially so if this is coupled with high matrix or aggressive samples, it may be necessary to replace parasultic pump tubing on a daily basis. Stopping or rerunning an analysis due to warm pump tubing is just not a worthy expense for your laboratory. I'd also like to mention a few things not to do. Uh, never insert anything through the orifice of the nebulizer, including wires or probes. Uh, this is likely to damage the nebulizer beyond repair. Never touch the tip of the nebulizer. Any deposit of body oils can have a detrimental effect on the performance of the nebulizer. Do not use any concentration of HF to clean the glass or quartz nebulizer. Even dilute HF or trace HF can alter the orifice of the internal capillary and deteriorate the performance of the nebulizer. Do not place a glass nebulizer in an ultrasonic bath as it may dislodge the internal capillary. And lastly, never use hot liquid to flush a sample capillary of an inert nebulizer, such as those made from PFA or puke. The temperature can potentially deform the capillary and affect nebulizer performance. To keep your nebulizer in good condition, always start and finish a run by nebulizing a mildly acidic blank solution followed by deionized water for several minutes. This ensures that sample deposits or crystals do not form on the inside of the nebulizer when the solvent dries, which can deteriorate performance and shorten its lifetime. Nebulizing a cleaning solution at the start and end of each day will also clean your spray chamber. To safely remove a blockage from a glass expansion nebulizer, use our LULA nebulizer cleaning tool and the following cleaning procedure to safely back flush your nebulizer. We have found that using the dilute concentration of Fluca RBS 25 is the best cleaning solution. Stubborn clogs may require an overnight soak or additional cleaning with nitric acid. Methanol can be used after flushing with deionized water to help dry out the nebulizer, but methanol or water alone is not a sufficient cleaning solution. We also have an informative step-by-step -step video for those of you who would like to learn more about the nebulizer cleaning procedure and LUO. As I just mentioned, the LUO is designed to efficiently deliver a cleaning solution through the nebulizer capillary to dislodge particle buildup and thoroughly clean the nebulizer. We suggest using the LUO regularly to maintain nebulizer performance and prolong nebulizer life. Uh, glass expansion has two LUO designs. We have an LUO for glass concentric nebulizers, which would be the sea spray, conical, micromist, and slurry. And we also have an LUO for inert concentric nebulizers, which would be the opal mist and the dirt mist. If blockages due to particulates are a frequent issue for your laboratory, you should consider adding the reusable inline filter. As previously mentioned, particulates are not always from the sample cells. Dust particles from the lab environment can end up in the sample tubes, as well as fibers from pre-filtering samples if a high quality filter isn't chosen or replaced when necessary. The Guardian inline particle filter provides a simple and effective way to eliminate these risks of blockages. The Guardian inline particle filter protects your nebulizer from blockages due to fibers and particulates, but how do you prevent nebulizer blockages caused by the buildup of salts? For any high total dissolved solids or high salt or high acid application, an argon humidifier is an absolutely essential accessory. Glass Expansion's Allegra is a compact and cost-effective humidifier design that provides approximately 100% relative humidity, which dramatically slows the buildup of salts at the tip of your nebulizer. Now let's review cone selection, cone conditioning, and cone cleaning. Why does cone material matter? The plasma discharge and interface region is an extremely aggressive environment. The coupling of a high temperature ionization source, the plasma, to the metallic interface of the spectrometer imposes 
demands in this region of the instrument that are unique to ICPMS. When this is combined with matrix, solvent, and analyte ions, along with particulates and neutral species being directed at a high velocity towards the interface cones, an extremely harsh environment as a result, thus the need to select the correct cones for your, for your application. Let's look at a few different materials cones can be made from. Cones made entirely from copper are often the lowest cost option. Since copper is more efficient in terms of heat transfer than nickel or platinum, this means that the temperature at the tip will be lower or that it runs colder. The consequences of this are that the rate of corrosion will be the highest along with oxide, salt, and sample deposition at the orifice. This means there will be a more frequent need for cleaning, perhaps daily. Aside from the extra time required due to increased maintenance, excessive cleaning can actually shorten the lifetime of the cone. Nickel cones are typically the standard option and are suitable for many common applications and are suitable for many common applications. Cones made from nickel can include solid nickel, a nickel insert with a copper base, or a nickel insert with a nickel plated base. These configurations are dependent on the instrument make and model. For example, there are two nickel based designs for sampler cones for the agile instruments. The standard is a nickel insert with a copper base, but a nickel insert with a nickel plated base is suggested for use with samples that contain higher than 5% hydrochloric acid. Since nickel is less efficient in terms of heat transfer than copper, this means that the temperature of the tip will be higher or that it runs hotter than copper. Uh, this means that the rate of corrosion as compared to copper will be slightly lower along with oxide, salt, and sample deposition at the orifice. Platinum cones, while obviously more expensive than copper or nickel, are the most durable and longest lasting option. Cones made from platinum are generally a platinum insert with a copper base, but some instruments and applications call for a platinum insert with a nickel base. Since platinum is least efficient in terms of heat transfer when compared to copper and nickel, this means that the temperature at the tip will be higher or that it runs hotter than copper and nickel. This results in greater chemical resistance along with fewer oxides, salt, and sample deposition at the orifice, as well as fewer polyatomic interferences. Examples of applications where you would use platinum codes include high matrix samples, meaning high TDS and particulates, aggressive or high concentrations of S's, organics, or when the lowest detection limits are needed. For the most aggressive samples, for example, a combination of high TDS and high acid concentration, a sampler cone with a larger diameter platinum insert can be used. For some ICPMS models, a sampler is available with a 10, 15, or 18 millimeter platinum insert. The larger insert provides a much greater life due to the larger surface area. One particular glass expansion customer found that the 15 millimeter and 18 millimeter inserts would last for upwards of 18 to 24 months compared to six to eight months with the 10 millimeter insert, as long as the orifice was still in good condition. The frequency at which the cones are cleaned depends very much on the application and the workload of the instrument. If the samples are clean and the usage is low, the cones may only need cleaning monthly. But if the instrument is in continuous use or if the samples contain high levels of dissolved solids or are highly corrosive, the cones may actually need cleaning daily. Please note you want to avoid any unnecessary cleaning as overcleaning the interface cones can lead to a shortened lifetime. There are both physical signs as well as experimental results that indicate the cones should be cleaned. Uh, as the sampler cone is more exposed to the plasma, it will usually need cleaning more frequently than the skimmer cones. If the performance of the instrument does not recover when the cones are cleaned, they may need to be replaced or refurbished. To extend the, the life of your cones, as well as other sample interaction components, and to decrease the cleaning frequency, always in the run by aspirating an acidified rinse solution followed by DI water for a few minutes. Cones should be cleaned if there are visible deposits near the orifice or if the orifice is blocked or distorted. Deterioration in the performance of the ICPMS can also indicate that the cones may need cleaning. In particular, you should watch for increased background signal, memory loss, loss of sensitivity, or distorted peak shapes. A change in the instrument vacuum reading can also indicate cone problems. If the orifice gets blocked, the vacuum will increase, meaning there'll be a pressure decrease, although there will usually be a deterioration in performance before this point. If the vacuum decreases, meaning there'll be a pressure increase, this could indicate that the orifice is worn and has increased in size. If this happens, the cone needs to be replaced. The method of cleaning will also depend on the application. If the samples are relatively clean, a gentle cleaning process will be sufficient. In some cases, routine cleaning with a cotton swab and DI water is suitable, but if the samples contain high levels of dissolved solids or are highly corrosive, a more aggressive cleaning procedure will be required. 
And just remember, in cleaning the cones, the goal is not to get them back to like new condition. You only want to remove excess deposition and corrosion and to leave a uniform coating on the surface. Uh, don't go polishing at the surface with any creams or powders. A Citronox solution is a gentle and effective cleaning agent and we recommend that it be tried first. If Citronox isn't effective, it may be necessary to use a more aggressive cleaning agent such as nitric acid. However, we recommend that nitric acid not be used unless it is completely necessary. Nitric acid is more corrosive than Citronox and prolonged use will definitely reduce the lifetime of the cones. Even Citronox will attack copper cones, so the cones should not be exposed to high concentrations of Citronox or exposed for long periods of time. Also, when cleaning cones which have a screw thread, be particularly careful that the spray is not contacted by nitric acid. And pre-sucking the cones in a detergent such as Fluca RBS-25 prior to cleaning with Citronox or nitric acid will help the cleaning process. There are three cleaning procedures we recommend, all increasing in order of aggressiveness, which are available on the Glass Expansion website. In addition, it is highly recommended to watch our Cones 101 webinar for valuable information regarding cone maintenance. The Cone Care Guide is also available for download from the Cones 101 webinar. Due to the sample matrices that are encountered in cannabis lit analysis, long rinse times are usually necessary. However, this can add significant time to the analysis. There are many switching valve accessories available on the market that can help to improve the productivity of your ICP. Unfortunately, most of these require complex method development, high installation costs, several fluidic connections, and a high consumable cost. For this reason, we recommend the simplest and lowest cost of glass expansions line of enhanced productivity accessories than the Agro Rapid Rinse. So how does the rapid rinse work? The valve can be in one of two positions, rinse, which is the left picture, or home inject, which is the right picture. During the rinse phase, the valve is positioned so that an auxiliary rinse solution is being aspirated into the ICP while, at the same time, the next sample is being taken up. After the sample uptake is complete and the sample has reached the valve, the valve automatically switches to inject and immediately begins aspirating sample. During this phase, the auxiliary rinse solution is being continuously pumped to the valve. Thus, as soon as the software gives the command that the sample is finished, the valve switches and immediately begins rinsing while taking up the next sample. The rapid rinse software, specifically the method wizard, calculates how long the probe needs to stay in the sample in order to take up the necessary volume of solution to complete each read. The benefit of this is twofold. One, there's no waste of the sample. And two, there's a decreased exposure of the sample introduction components, so the nebulizer, spray chamber, torch, cones, etc., to the hazardous matrix. This increases the lifetime of consumables and minimizes instrument downtime due to maintenance. Lastly, following the time and sample phase, the probe is sent back to the rinse station to rinse the probe and uptake lines for the duration of the sample analysis, ensuring complete washout of the entire sample introduction system. The Niagara Rapid Rinse provides a simple, low-cost approach to improving ICP productivity. Typical time saved with the Niagara is approximately 30%, with little to no changes to the current ICP method settings and no degradation in performance. While the typical time savings is around 30%, we have seen time savings upwards of 95%. To estimate the time savings for your lab, you can use the Niagara calculator on our website or simply contact us to help. Now let's look at spray chambers and the factors that affect washout. Glass Expansion's new Helix CT locking screw with built-in torque control mechanism was released in 2018. This unique nebulizer interface allows for a consistent seal of the PTFE ferrule against the nebulizer, making it impossible to over-tighten or under-tighten while ensuring a gas-tight seal each and every time, in addition to providing the only zero dead volume connection available. The Helix CT interface is the standard option with all glass expansion spray chamber designs. In addition to maintaining consistent performance, the Helix CT also contributes to a faster washout time. Don't be fooled by other O-ring free spray chamber designs or the older O-ring interfaces. Glass Expansion's Helix CT is the truly only zero dead volume interface. If you suffer from long washout times, check if you have liquid pooling around the nebulizer seal. As a comparison between the Helix interface and the common O-ring interface, we aspirated a blue dye and filmed how long it took to rinse out the non-GE design. It was well over 10 minutes before the blue dye had rinsed out. A Scott style spray chamber was at one point the standard spray chamber on all ICPs until glass expansion developed the cyclonic spray chamber, which is now the industry standard. 
The advantage of a cyclonic spray chamber over a Scott style chamber is twofold. One advantage is more efficient removal of large droplets. Unlike a Scott style spray chamber, a cyclonic spray chamber uses centrifugal force to impact the large droplets on the chamber wall. The second advantage is faster washout. The cyclonic design has dramatically lower surface area and volume from which to remove the previous sample. On the next slide, we'll see a washout comparison of these two spray chambers in the same instrument. We performed a washout comparison on the same instrument under the same conditions using a 100 ppb mercury solution. In this graph, you can see that mercury solution washed out nearly twice as fast with a cyclonic spray chamber as it did in the Scott style spray chamber. Thank you all for your time today. If you have any questions or are interested in a quote, you can contact one of our three offices directly. We also have a global distribution network that can be found on the Glass Expansion website. Okay, thank you, Justin. I just want to remind the audience, if you have any questions for Justin or uh, something popped up that you'd like to ask Bob, uh, please post those via the chat window. And again, we'll get those get to those questions at the conclusion of the webinar. And now I'll go ahead and pass things over to John Peters of Shimazu. Hello, thank you everyone for joining us. My name is John Peters. I am the product manager for elemental spectroscopy at Shimazu Scientific Instruments. I'd like to thank everyone for joining as well as CEM, Glass Expansion and Robert Thomas for participating in this webinar today. I would like to discuss trace metals analysis in cannabis, tips and tricks for the ICPMS 2030, how to optimize a method, hardware configurations, and how to best optimize and maintain the system to minimize maintenance and downtime. A little background and overview about Shimatsu. The Shimatsu corporate philosophy is contributing to society through science and technology and the management principle is realizing our wishes for the well-being of both mankind and the earth. Shimatsu was established in 1875 in Kyoto, Japan by Ginzo Shimatsu and currently has over 3,000 employees in Japan and over 12,000 globally with an annual revenue of over $3.5 billion. In 2018, Shimatsu became the second largest scientific instrumentation manufacturer in the world behind Thermo. Shimatsu in the United States was established in 1975 as Shimatsu Scientific Instruments. SSI is a US-based corporation that provides analytical solutions for laboratories in North America, Latin America, and the Caribbean nations. SSI has over 500 employees at combined locations, including headquarters in Columbia, Maryland, and 10 regional offices, all of which offer sales, training, service, technical support, and marketing activities. Shimatsu Scientific Instruments portfolio of tools and technologies include optical spectroscopy, chromatography and mass spectrometry, life sciences, balances, consumables, environmental market, surface analysis, physical testing systems, thermal analysis, non-destructive testing, as well as training and support on all. Within that broad family of analytical technologies is the elemental spectroscopy group, which includes inductively coupled plasma optical emission spectrometry, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry, energy dispersive X-ray fluorescence, X-ray diffraction, atomic absorption, as well as carbon analyzers, both online and benchtop instruments, and both combustion and UV persulfate wet chemical oxidation technologies. These instruments serve a variety of industries and markets, including cannabis, food and beverage, pharmaceutical, environmental, clinical, semiconductor, oil and gas, forensics, academic and research, geochemical and mining, biotechnology, semiconductor, and government. Relative detection limits for each technology are detailed on this slide, 
and it is observed that the ICPMS is most commonly utilized in cannabis and other applications relevant to human health. The ability to detect smallest amounts possible of mercury, cadmium, lead, and arsenic, as well as any other elements of interest, allows for the safety of products for human consumption that can be verified. The ICPMS is used for cannabis analysis because it has the best detection limits of any technology available for the analysis of heavy metals. Utilizing a collision cell can reduce polyatomic interferences caused by binding of various smaller atoms at high heat. For example, argon-40 chloride-35 is the same 75 mass-to-charge ratio as arsenic-75, but is much larger. The collision cell removes the argon chloride from the flow path so that only arsenic is detected. Using the assistant functions can reduce the amount of method development time and can assist with troubleshooting the method for potential problems. The ICPMS 2030 also has a 40% reduction in argon consumption using the mini torch design which allows for the same temperature and ionization potential of a conventional torch using half the argon. Eco mode allows the plasma to stay lit and the instrument warmed up in between sample sequences while consuming 70% less argon than a conventional torch. Also, the purity of argon can be lower and still light, offering additional laboratory operations savings. Particularly, as cost of argon increases steadily, this advantage will apply for years to head. The collision cell reduces polyatomic interferences. Here we see the result of using the helium collision cell to remove the previously mentioned example of argon chloride. The chloride issue is of particular importance when using hydrochloric acid to stabilize mercury in the sample matrix. Another common need for this is when iron with a most abundant isotope of mass 56, which is the same mass to charge ratio as argon oxide 40 plus 16. Argon being present in the plasma and oxygen being present in the matrix makes this a common interference, but there are many others. The result of not removing these polyatomic interferences is that all data points, including the blank, will have some amount of signal added to each sample, resulting in the calibration curve that is still linear but with a high y-intercept and poor detection limits. Lab Solutions DB and CS for the ICPMS allows for 21 CFR Part 11 data handling and security compliance requirements for regulated labs and customers who would like to control access to data and maintain audit trail capabilities. It is applicable to the ICPMS and all other Shimatsu instruments as well. Now that we have discussed Shimatsu's overview and some background about ICPMS, let's get into some detail about methodology in heavy metals analysis of cannabis related products. One consideration when choosing various method parameters is what kind of sample matrix will be encountered. If, for example, the sample matrix is pure water, the preparation requirements may be only acidifying and maybe filtering the sample. If, however, the samples need to be microwave digested, the process becomes more complicated. Many cannabis related products require microwave digestion, but not filtration. Products such as MCT oil or vape pens, edible oils, gummies, cookies, cheeses, meats, and jerky, lotions, balms, all digest without leaving behind particulate matter. However, plant materials such as hemp or cannabis flour produce silicates that must be removed prior to running on the ICPMS. One method for removal is to centrifuge and then draw up liquid from the top of the sample vial. This, however, is time consuming and not ideal because some particulate matter is still present. A second method is to add a small amount of hydrofluoric acid to dissolve the silicates, 
but this offers a variety of safety concerns and will affect the longevity and functionality of consumable glassware, such as the nebulizer, spray chamber, and torch. The preferred and recommended way to remove silicate particles from sample dilutions is with a 0.45 micron PTFE syringe filter like the one shown. Please note that the Guardian inline filter is 120 microns, and while it is recommended to use, it will not remove the fine particulates from the sample dilution that can affect nebulizer performance. One may notice that when the nebulizer performance is affected, the signal, particularly the internal standard signal, will decrease and or the RSDs and precision will suffer. Because the ICPMS has a thermally controlled spray chamber and is insulated from view, it is not possible to see the aerosol coming out of the end of the nebulizer during normal operation. The efficiency and consistency of the aerosol contributes directly to the stability and strength of the signal on the ICPMS, so checking this can diagnose a variety of issues. To check the aerosol and nebulizer performance, First, put the probe in DI water and flush the line. Then turn off the plasma and remove the nebulizer from the spray chamber. Under instrument control, apply the peristaltic pump speed and nebulizer gas values from the method, not the plasma gas or auxiliary gas. The pump will feed water to the nebulizer and the nebulizer gas will create the aerosol seen in the photo here. Ideally, the aerosol should be as seen here, very fine particles resembling a mist and symmetrical to the tip of the nebulizer, not tilted in one direction. The spray should be consistent spray and not spitting. Uptake rate should be about 0.6 milliliters per minute. This can be checked with a stopwatch and with a graduated cylinder containing water. The aerosol can be checked at various different nebulizer gas and pump speeds also to see the effect these parameters have on the spray. When finished, reinstall the nebulizer in the spray chamber and the probe in the auto sampler as normal. Another consideration when planning an ICPMS method for heavy metals analysis of cannabis products is the matrix of the sample and sample dilution. Dilution of the acid matrix from the digestion step is recommended so that the sample matrix going into the ICPMS is at or below 5% nitric acid. If hydrochloric acid is used to stabilize mercury, it is recommended to keep this concentration at or below 0.5%. There are multiple advantages to dilution to the range 1 to 5% nitric acid. The lower viscosity of the low acid solution creates a more efficient aerosol as observed in the previous slide. Higher viscosity, high acid solutions tend to produce larger particles, more of which are stuck to the side of the spray chamber and go to waste rather than being swept into the plasma and creating detector response. The result is that dilution can increase the signal strength of a sample and thus improve the detection limits of a method. A second important advantage of dilution is that it improves the maintenance and upkeep costs. The Shimatsu ICPMS is already a low operations cost option, but reducing the frequency requirements for cleaning and replacing consumables like cones, nebulizers, torches, as well as instrument maintenance, such as O-rings and detectors, can add to the savings from diluting samples. This is particularly applicable to methods where hydrochloric acid is employed, as this is more corrosive to instrument components. Dilution also creates less concentrated acid waste for removal, and it requires less of the expensive spectroscopy grade acids in sample preparation of standards and rinse solutions matched for matrix. It is recommended to use high quality ICPMS grade water and acids when preparing samples. 
it is also recommended to have a consistent sample matrix in between samples in a sequence. If the calibration verification samples are prepared in 1% nitric acid and the samples are 5% nitric acid in between samples, the acids will need to mix in the sample line during analysis and will create turbulence, fluctuating density and viscosity, and resulting fluctuations in internal standard intensities. This can create data problems as well. It is recommended that everything in a method, including the rinse, have the same sample matrix. One important note about nomenclature. What is referred to as 1% nitric acid is assumed to be by volume from concentrated stock solutions. Concentrated spectroscopy grade nitric acid is 68 to 70% nitric acid by weight. Dilutions are referenced by volume and are specified with the nomenclature V over V, volume over volume. This means that one milliliter of concentrated nitric acid diluted to 100 milliliters with water is referred to as 1% nitric acid, not 0.7%. This becomes important when calculating sample dilutions for maximum efficiency of the aerosol and optimizing instrument maintenance. Carryover considerations should be of paramount importance in selecting parameters in an ICPMS method for analysis of heavy metals in cannabis. Mercury, in particular, is difficult because it is sticky and can permeate the walls of a polypropylene sample vial. Various methods to control the carryover and stabilize mercury have been employed successfully. A common one is to use 0.5% hydrochloric acid in the sample matrix. The advantage of this is relatively low cost. The disadvantage is that chloride ions create polyatomic interferences particularly with arsenic. Arsenic 75 has the same mass to charge ratio as argon chloride, 40 plus 35. This can be reduced with a collision cell, but it requires that the method now have two conditions for different elements of analysis and adds time to the analysis. A second method for stabilizing mercury is to use one part per million gold in the sample matrix and rinse. This is effective, but has a disadvantage of being relatively expensive and can reduce the lifespan of the detector. The best method is 0.1 to 0.5% L-cysteine in the rinse and sample matrices. The advantage of this is cost and the absence of isobaric or polyatomic interferences. Additionally, carryover can be minimized using sample introduction hardware. A dual rinse station can improve carryover by allowing two different rinse solutions to be employed in sequence after each sample analysis. Changing the rinse time and uptake rate can also produce improved washouts. Finally, a rapid sample introduction hardware system such as the Glass Expansion Niagara can both improve throughput and reduce the amount of acid rinse required for optimum carryover and extend the life of the consumables as well. Hardware recommendation options for heavy metals analysis of cannabis products via ICPMS are detailed here. Nickel sampler and skimmer cones are recommended for their resistance to acid matrices better than copper cones while still being cost effective. Platinum cones are also available, but are only necessary when running samples that contain any amount of sulfuric acid, laser ablation applications, or when running samples for extremely low concentrations of nickel or copper. Gold-plated RF coils are recommended for their resistance to acid matrices. An inline filter is recommended to protect the instrument on both the liquid and gas inputs. The liquid filter is 120 micrometers, however, and does not substitute for filtration of fibrous materials containing silicate particles after digestion using a 0.45 micron PTFE syringe filter. A power conditioner is recommended to protect the instrument, but also to regulate voltage to the instrument 
which can improve the baseline and detection limits of the instrument. An uninterrupted power supply is available, but the ventilation system should be backed up so that the instrument does not shut down automatically due to heat buildup. A UPS is not required to protect the turbo pump on the Shimatsu, however. The Shimatsu ICPMS locks out power to the turbo pump after a power outage so that it has time to spin down before being powered back up. This can damage a very expensive component. Proper ventilation should be checked. Too little ventilation will allow heat to build up and automatically shut down the ICPMS. Inconsistent or too much ventilation can cause fluctuations in the plasma, resulting in more inconsistent baseline in effects on the method detection limit. Installation manual guidelines for ventilation are recommended to check periodically. Maintenance and tuning schedules and recommended usage guidelines, as well as method development recommendations, are available for download. Hardware front end recommendations will be covered by my colleagues at Glass Expansion, while digestion and sample preparation recommendations will be detailed by CEM. Here are experimental conditions for this data set using the hardware recommendations discussed as well as recommended digestion parameters from CEM on the Mars 6 system. A Niagara rapid rinse sample introduction system from glass expansion was installed on the front end of the ICPMS. ICPMS method parameters were set to target arsenic, cadmium, mercury, and lead, elements required by California for cannabis regulations, as well as by all other states. Additional elements of interest based on state regulations will be detailed by Robert Thomas, but were not tested in this data set. The internal standards were scandium, indium, and bismuth, with masses for each falling within 30 mass to charge ratio units from each element of interest. The internal standard automatic addition kit was employed, as well as the standard cannabis package Shimatsu ICPMS 2030 hardware, coaxial glass nebulizer, cyclone spray chamber, mini torch, as well as nickel sampling and skimmer cones. The sample matrix after digestion and dilution was 4.5% nitric acid and 0.5% hydrochloric acid by volume consistent with ICPMS operating recommendations, with the hydrochloric acid employed to stabilize mercury and prevent carryover problems. ICPMS operating conditions for this data set are listed here, with carrier gas set to 0.7 liters per minute and peristaltic pump speed set to 20 RPM to optimize aerosol nebulizer efficiency and to achieve an uptake rate of 0.6 milliliters per minute with the sample matrix. The spray chamber temperature was also optimized to maximum efficiency and signal to oxide ratio. The calibrations for each element are shown in this chart, all with R squared values greater than three nines and detection limits in the PPT range. Graphical representations of the calibration curves are displayed here. Spike recoveries are a good way to ensure that the method is capturing the element from your sample digestion effectively, that it is not being lost or compounded by some process in the sample preparation or digestion steps. Here we see excellent spike recoveries for a variety of sample matrices, blank matrix, hard candy, granola bar, lotion, soft candy, froggy, and hemp flower. Recoveries within 10% of target are observed for all. Similarly, spike recoveries were excellent for MCT oil, which is important for vaping and other applications. Ghee cheese, hemp oil, beef jerky, peanut butter, and concentrated CBD oil. All of these matrices digested successfully on the same sample turret simultaneously using the Mars 6 digester. 
we see that the RSDs for arsenic were higher than the typically very low RSDs for other elements due to the requirement that we employ collision cell gas conditions for the analysis of this element. The most fun part of the data set is the declaration of how much of these harmful elements are actually in the samples we tested. All of the sample matrices were purchased from a retail outlet and are intended for consumer use. So it is of primary interest to the end user what they are being exposed to. This chart illustrates the levels of arsenic, cadmium, mercury, and lead in each sample. ND, or none detected, was declared when the signal produced numbers below the calculated method detection limit from the calibration curve, which was 8.2 parts per trillion arsenic, 1.3 parts per trillion cadmium, 2.3 parts per trillion mercury, and 0.3 parts per trillion lead. And with that, I would like to thank everyone for your attention and turn the webinar back to my colleagues. Please stay after the webinar is over and we will answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Okay, thank you, John. I just wanna remind everyone that again, if you have any questions for any of our presenters to post those by the chat window and we will get those after the conclusion of our last presentation. And now I will pass things over to Robert Thomas from Principal Scientific Solutions. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd first like to thank Glass Expansion for inviting me to participate in this webinar. I'd also like to mention that this presentation is based on one of the chapters in my new book entitled Measuring Heavy Metals in Cannabis and Hemp, which was published at the end of September. I'd like to begin with an overview of my presentation. I'll kick off my talk with the current status of heavy metal regulations for cannabis and hemp, particularly the limitations of a fractured and disjointed state-based system. I'll then focus on how the pharmaceutical and diet supplement industries approach regulating elemental impurities and how they abandoned the 100-year-old semi-quantitative colorimetric method and replaced it with modern instrumental techniques. I'll offer also offer my perspective on what the cannabis and hemp industry can learn from this process. I'll end the talk with my thoughts on how the cannabis industry should move forward with federal oversight around the corner. So I'll offer my perspective and observations about what I've learned over the past two years in researching and writing my book. So where is cannabis legal in the US today? Here's a map of the US with light green representing states where medicinal cannabis is legal and dark green where both recreational and medicinal is legal. Cannabis is legal for medicinal use in 33 states plus Washington DC. It is legal for adult recreational use in 11 states plus Washington DC. However, many of the other states are going through the legalization process. So this map could look very different in 12 months. Most of the 33 states have heavy metals limits, but not all. Majority of states just specify four heavy metals known as the big four, lead, cadmium, arsenic, and mercury. Maryland adds chromium, selenium, silver, and barium, while New York adds nickel, chromium, antimony, zinc, and copper. Oregon has no heavy metal limits at all. Let's take a more detailed look at some of the individual states. This is a table of heavy metal maximum allowable limits for seven different states, California, Colorado, Oregon, Maryland, New York, Connecticut, and Massachusetts, compared to United States Pharmacopeia Chapter 232 permitted daily exposure limits, often called PTEs for elemental impurities in drug products, and Chapter 2232 PDE limits for dietary supplements, together with the American Arbol American herbal pharmacopoeia limits for heavy metals in botanicals and herbal products. A couple of points to emphasize. USP chapter 232 defines a total of 24 elemental impurities based on the drug delivery method, which is oral, parenteral, or inhalation. While chapter 2232 only defines the big four heavy metals, lead acid, cadmium, mercury, in dietary supplements. So in this table, 12 of those elements have been included 
to reflect the big flaw plus the additional elements in Maryland and New York. It's also very important to emphasize that chapter 232 limits in this table are based on microgram per day. So to know what's allowable in the actual drug or supplement, these limits must be recalculated based on the suggested daily dosage for that particular drug or supplement. For example, if the maximum dosage is 10 gram per day, these limits must be divided by 10 to convert to microgram per gram in the drug. So let's begin with California. California was the very first state to regulate cannabis in 1986. And as a result, it is considered the gold standard with regard to cannabis regulations. California limits are defined in microgram per gram in two different categories, inhalation cannabis products and all other cannabis products. So these are as the same as USP chapter 232 PD lim PDE limits for inhaled and oral drug respectively based on 10 gram per day. It's also worth pointing out that even though pharmaceutical PDEs are based on 10 gram of suggested doses per day, we really have no way of knowing in what quantities people consume cannabis products. Here are the limits for Colorado, which are a little more complex than California. Colorado limits are categorized by heavy metals of interest in the first column, acceptable limits in the second, and products to be tested in the third. The acceptable limits are defined in par per million in the product and not microgram per gram. Besides inhaled and oral, they also include limits for transdermal products. The limits for inhaled products are based on USP chapter 232 PDE levels for inhaled drug compounds, but the limits for oral products are based on USP chapter 2232 for dietary supplements. However, the topical values are based on FDA limits for heavy metals and cosmetics. Note these values are based on acceptable limits for one gram of intended use and not 10 gram as in California. Here are the limits for Connecticut. They're defined a little differently because they are based on microgram of heavy metal contaminant per kilogram of use of body weight per day. So it's very difficult to get a good understanding what this means with regards to maximum daily consumption because it's only based on body weight of the consumer. However, in toxicology studies, very often a typical body weight of 60 to 70 kilogram is used, but you still need to know what is the recommended consumption per day of cannabis product to make the calculation of the heavy metal maximum allowable limit. Here are the limits for my state, Maryland. These limits cover all cannabis products and are defined in part per million based on five gram of consumption per day. They are the same as chapter 232 PDEs for inhaled products, irrespective of how the products are consumed. This is actually quite common in many other states. They're not sure where to set the limit, so they pick the USP inhalation PDEs because they are the lowest. Note, Maryland also includes four additional elements, silver, selenium, barium, and chromium, but do not explain why these contaminants have been added. So it's important to understand that besides chromium, the other elements do not have any significant, significant toxicology impact at these levels. So let's talk more about the PDEs defined in chapters USP 232, 2232 and ICH Q3D guidelines. Here's a full list of USP chapter 232 PDE levels, which are based on maximum limits in microgram per day for 24 elemental impurities in the drug compound per delivery method. So for a suggested maximum daily dose of 10 gram, these limits should be divided by 10. Note, chapter 232 limits are the same as the ones defined in ICH Q3D guidelines for elemental impurities. For those of you who are not familiar with the ICH, it is short for the Internal International Council for Harmonization of Technical Requirements for Pharmaceuticals for Human Use, which is a consortium representing the global pharmaceutical industry, include the United States, European, and Japanese pharmacopoeias. Here are the USP chapter 2232 PDE limits. These specific, 
These specifically give maximum limits per day for dietary supplements only. It should be emphasized that this chapter also addresses different forms of arsenic and mercury because of the potential of different arsenic species in plant-based botanical su supplements, as well as the potential of methylmercury in fish oil or kelp-based products as a result of the conversion of elemental mercury to methylmercury by many fish and aquatic species by the process of bioaccumulation. At this part of the presentation, I'd like to give you a little background to the United States Pharmacopeia. USP is an independent non-profit organization which is not a part of the US government. However, it works very closely with government agencies, ministries, and regulatory authorities, authorities around the world. The mission of the USP is to improve the health of people through public standards to ensure the quality, safety, and purity of medicines, dietary supplements, and foods. USP standards have ensured consistency for drug products throughout the world for close to 200 years are recognized in more than 130 countries. These standards, known as the United States Pharmacopeia National Formulary, or USP NF for short, is a book of public standards for drug substances, dosage forms, compounded preparations, excipients, medical devices, and dietary supplements. The FDA designates the USP NF as the official compendium for drugs sold and marketed in the United States, which must conform to these standards to avoid possible charges of adulteration and misbranding. So what is the USP process to change a standard method? USP continually revises standards through a unique public-private collaborative process, which involves scientists and industry, academia and government, as well as other interested parties. The test for heavy metals was first described in USP Chapter 231, which was first introduced in 1908. The test relies on precipitation of the metal sulfide in the sample and compares the color intensity to a lead standard. USP expert committees felt that it was time to replace Chapter 231 with methodology that reflects modern test methods and updated toxicology data. So let's briefly explain USP chapter 231. Chapter 231 is based on a sulfide precipitation of the analyte elements using an organosulfur compound and assumes that all analyte heavy metals behave in a similar manner to a lead standard which samples are compared to. It is semi-quantitative at best that was initially intended to detect a small group of heavy metals, but there was no clear definition of which individual elements the, the method was detecting. It is well recognized to have many limitations, so it's pretty amazing that it has survived over 100 years. So what are the limitations of USP chapter 231? This slide shows the colored sulfide precipitation of 12 different heavy metals. Imagine if all 12 elements are present in the sample, how difficult it would be to compare the color to the lead standard, which is circled in red. So it cannot detect individual heavy metals, Typically five ppm is the limit of detection. It's very labor intensive, and the interpretation of the color varies with the experience of the analyst. It also needs a large sample of approximately five gram to work. So let's look at the timeline that USP used to change this method. It began in 1995, where a USP pharmacopoeial forum report identified issues with the chapter 231 method. Then in, 2000, then in 2000, in an article in the Journal of Pharmaceutical and Biomedical Analysis, it proposed ICMS, ICPMS as an alternative technique. In 2004, an article in the same journal showed major recoveries with USP chapter 231. Then between 2005 and 2017, various expert committees Expert panels, working groups, stakeholder meetings discussed the logistics of implementing these proposed changes. Then in January 2018, all three USP chapters and ICHQ3D guidelines were finally approved and adopted. So how did USP and ICH propose the design and scope of these new PDE limits? Well, they decided it was important to have a chapter specifically for pharmaceuticals only. They call this chapter 232. 
They also wanted to separate dietary supplements from pharmaceuticals since they are regulated differently both in the US and other regions of the world. They call this chapter 2232. They wanted to simplify the harmonization process between USP and ICH by separating chapters 232 and 2232 limits from the plasma spectrochemistry analytical procedure which were described in chapter 233. Let's talk more about the classification of elemental impurities in pharmaceuticals. This is a slide of PDE, PDEs defined in chapter 232 in microgram per day for the three different drug delivery systems, which I showed earlier. But this time I would like to emphasize the first column, which is the class of elemental impurity. Class one includes the classic heavy metals, lead, arsenic, cadmium, and mercury, which are human toxicants that have no use in the manufacture of pharmaceuticals. These should be evaluated at all times. Class 2A elements have a high probability of occurrence in the drug product and should be evaluated at all times. Class 2B elements have a reduced probability of occurrence related to the low abundance and as a result they can be excluded unless they are intentionally added during the manufacture of the drug product. And then finally class 3 they have relatively low toxicities by the oral route of administration, but could, be what, but could warrant consideration for inhalation and intravenous routes. So what elemental impurities could potentially end up in the drug product? They identified four different sources. First, elements intentionally added in the formulation of the drug substance. Examples of these include platinum group metal catalysts, which are often used in the organic synthesis of drugs. Elements that are not intentionally added and are potentially present in the preparation of the drug product. Examples of this might include talcum powder, which is used primarily to improve powder flow in tablet compression. Talc is basically magnesium silicate that is mined from the earth, so it can potentially contain high levels of certain heavy metals. Elements that are potentially introduced in the drug substance from the manufacturing equipment itself. Examples of this include the leaching out of chromium, nickel and iron from stainless steel mixing or storage vessels. And finally, elements that have the potential to be leached into the drug product from the plastic storage containers or closure systems. So this has given you a flavor of how the pharmaceutical industry went about regulating elemental impurities. Let's now take a closer look at the sources of heavy metals in cannabis. So there are three major potential sources of heavy metals, heavy metal contaminants in cannabis products. They can be derived from cultivation sources, including the soil for outdoor, outdoor cultivation or indoor hydroponic grow medium, the water itself, fertilizers, nutrients, growth enhancers and pesticides. There's also sources from the process and manufacturing process, including extraction and purification procedures, cutting and blending equipment services, mixing containers, storage vessels, plus edible product recipe ingredients and tablet capsule formulations. Finally, the third source is delivery sources, which include devices such as vaping pens, inhalers, patches, or dropper bottles. So let's take a closer look at what elements could potentially be of concern in growing cannabis and the manufacture of cannabis products. First of all, it should be emphasized that if cannabis is grown indoors under more controlled conditions, the plant is typically has lower levels of heavy metals. However, if it's grown outdoors, there are about 15 heavy metals found in natural ecosystems and contamination from industrial activities such as mining, metal refineries, petrochemical plants, power plants, and cement work, etc., that could potentially be sources of contaminants in the plant. Also, decades of using leaded paint and leaded gasoline has left its mark on the environment. The list of elements shown here are the, are the ones taken from evidence in the public domain of heavy metals being taken up at various levels by cannabis and hemp plants. There is also the potential for concentration of the elemental contaminants due to the extraction of the cannabinoids. If it's in the plant and the flowers, there is a very good chance that it will end up to some degree in the extract. In addition, the manufacturing process could add to this lace based on the metallic equipment used to grind extract and purify the cannabinoids 
such as nickel chromium iron from stainless steel containers. To emphasize this point, there have been multiple product recalls over the past six to 12 months for elevated levels of heavy metals in, in cannabis products. Let's take a look at a few examples. There was a case recently where a CBD oil producer from Florida was forced to recall a CBD tincture by the FDA because it had 10 times higher lead levels than the maximum allowable limit for Florida, which was 0.5 ppm. A CBD manufacturer also in Florida claimed the product was heavy metal free, but on further testing, it was found to be over the legal limit for lead, copper, and nickel. This case is currently going through the litigation process. 13 strains of medical marijuana sold at a licensed medical center in Michigan were recalled because they were contaminated with high levels of cadmium and arsenic. Medical cannabis regulators in Maryland issued an advisory to notify patients for potential lead contamination of cannabis liquids in vape cartridges following exposure to heat inside the device. So just to summarize my thoughts on regulations of cannabis, the current list of four heavy metals, lead, cadmium, arsenic, and mercury, is clearly inadequate. However, the 24 elements required by the pharmaceutical industry would probably be an overkill. I think that elemental contaminants derived from the growing medium, fertilizers, nutrients, manufacturing process, delivery containers, would warrant regulating at least an additional 12, 10 to 12 elements. So a future regulated, a future federally regulated list of potential heavy metal contaminants in cannabis could include the big four, plus additional elements in Maryland and New York, plus an additional four to five elements based on evidence in the public domain, making a total of 16 to 17 elements. And my last but one slide shows my three books, which have been the source for most of the material in my presentation. In particular, I'd like to mention my most recent book, Measuring Heavy Metal Contaminants in Cannabis and Hemp, which has just recently been published. More information about this book and the other two can be found on my publisher's website. With that, I thank you for your attention and I hand you back to the Glass Expansion folks. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you, Rob, and thank you, Bob, Justin, and John. Uh, we have roughly about 10 minutes dedicated to questions and answers. We already have a few queued up, but I'd like to encourage those of you who still have questions, if you haven't posted them, go ahead and post those via the chat window. All right, so the first question is gonna go over to Bob Lockerman over at CEM, and it's sort of a two-part, question from the same attendee. So I'm going to answer or repeat that question for you. For sample weighing, is it okay to use weighing paper? And then the second part of that question is, does the guard temperature change with each batch? Okay, Ryan, I can, uh, thank you. I can, I can handle that. Um, the first one is the weighing paper. The key is is, is there any contamination in the weighing paper itself? Uh, we've used weighing paper, and if we just send it down without sending the weighing paper down uh, with the um, uh, sample to the bottom of the, the vessel, then uh, we're not as worried as much. But if the weighing paper is going to become part of the sample, so to speak, then that's why we use the cellulose acetate. That tends to be the cleanest. We still do a blank value. We've, we, um, we'll still run one cellulose filter paper through the entire system just to see if by, by chance we picked up a blank. And again, it's gonna depend upon how low are you looking? Are you looking uh, lo mid to low PPM or, in, or high PPB? Probably not gonna be an issue. Looking down in the lower PPB level, you gotta make sure that, that the filter paper is not influencing down at that level. Uh, we found that the cellulose filter paper does not, potentially because of the fact it's used to, uh, for air monitoring. So I'm, I'm assuming that those filters have to be pretty darn clean, so to speak. About the guard temperature or the temp guard as we kind of call it, the temp guard cha does change. What temp guard is, is a way to make sure none of the vessels go too high as compared to the others. So you saw on the chart that some of the vessels were higher in temperature, and I pointed that out. But what we want to make sure is that they don't go too high. The higher in temperature that you run, the higher the temp guard goes. So typically at a 210 degree run, the temp guard feature is sitting up there at 240. 
So if any of the vessels go at 200 or get achieve 240, it will stop the run because it's assuming that that, temp, that vessel's running away from the rest. None of those vessels were indicating that. I would think the highest temperature we achieved was 230, and uh, if that, probably 225. So a good 15 degrees or so below the temp guard point. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Uh, okay, I've got a question for John Peters. If analyzing trace metal analysis, do you still recommend sample dilution? Uh, the the short answer is that the sample matrix depends uh, entirely on the acid content going into it. So if it's possible to do trace metal analysis at the lower acid concentration, then then definitely yes. If you're doing a strong acid and and testing it for um, trace metals, then diluting it so the acid content is below five percent is is necessary. If you're just testing water um, or something that isn't already acidified, then it does not need to be diluted. So the main concern is making sure that the matrix going into the ICPMS is five percent or below. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, uh, I have another question for Bob. Uh, we had a question: How can we reduce acid memory in the CEM digestion vessel? Okay, another good question. Let me go ahead and grab onto that. What is acid memory? Uh, that's a great question. Acid memory is the fact that when you finish the digestion and we we, we pour it out and then we go ahead and we do um, we do a cleaning procedure, so to speak. It is possible and likely for nitric acid to get entrained and moved into the Teflon. Teflon is semi-porous. You need to get it out of there. Um, uh, if, if after a few uses, you're not going to see it, but it's going to build up, and that's what we call it memory. What it will show is it will cause that temp guard issue that was asked before, because if it's got entrained nitric acid, it will heat hotter than the rest of your vessel. Uh, there's an easy way to get it out. It's just basically using an, uh, an air dry oven. And we basically just uh, set the temperature in the, uh, at about 150 degrees and run it there for a while. And that will knock the nitric acid out. As long as we're above the boiling point of nitric, it will remove the nitric fumes. So it's not that you're going to see nitric acid sitting in there. You've cleaned that out. It's just that your vessels are going to have a, an orange reddish appearance. And if you have those and you put those in there with vessels that are not so reddish orange or maybe brand new, you can see an issue. But an, a bake out is what we call it, is where you can do that. And you can find bake out procedures on the CEM website at cem.com. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Okay, we've actually got a couple of questions uh, surrounding uh, mercury. So the, the first one that I'm going to ask is for Rob Thomas. Uh, we had an attendee ask, what is the likelihood of, of actually seeing mercury in the cannabis? Okay. Um, yeah, you, of, of all the product recalls we've seen over the past six to 12 months, you've never seen mercury. You've seen lead, arsenic, uh, cadmium, nickel. Um, so mercury is a, is a heavy metal contaminant, but it depends where the cannabis is grown. For example, if it's grown in California and it's grown very close to where there's an abandoned gold or silver mine, we know that mercury was used to extract gold and silver using amalgamation. So we know for certain that the soil in areas which have seen gold and silver mines, there's a very good chance you could see mercury. So as we know, one of the major growing regions of the US is in the, um, is in the Emerald Triangle states. And uh, you know, there could possibly be mercury in some of the, uh, some of the plants that grown outdoors. On the same, in the same vein, if a cannabis is grown in Hawaii, we know that vol volcanic dust, volcanic earth, does also contain high levels of mercury. So I think if we begin to see more cannabis coming from places like Hawaii, I think we could see more um, more problems with mercury. And one other point I think, and this is very important to emphasize, is that with uh, cannabis is grown indoors, they're beginning to use fish extracts as fertilizers, as growth enhancers. They, they, they've improved that they can increase bud size. Well, unfortunately, 
with a fish extract, there's a good chance that it could contain some forms of mercury, depending on what type of fish extract is being used. So we're now beginning to see higher levels of mercury coming into, you know, cannabis for for, for the reasons I mentioned. Yep. Okay, thanks, Rob. And then uh, sticking with the uh, topic of mercury, uh, I'm going to switch over to Justin with this one. Um, you showed some data showing an enhancement of mercury washout with a cyclonic uh, compared to a Scott. Uh, we have an attendee asking if we offer a cyclonic spray chamber with a UHMI port that's compatible with the Agilent 7900 ICPMF. Sure. Um, yeah, so we do have a compatible spray chamber. We actually sell it as a kit, a PCC kit, stands for Peltier Cooled Cyclonic. And what that does is it replaces the standard Scott spray chamber and Peltier device that comes standard on the Agile instrument. So this kit is a, it's got its own Peltier cooler and it connects directly to the instrument water connections and electronics and it's controlled through the software just as you normally would on the standard configuration. However, it allows you to use a cyclonic spray chamber with the UHMI port, um, and that option is actually going to be released uh, any any day now. But this way, you can use a cyclonic spray chamber, uh, and that can either be quartz, PSA, uh, or glass. Perfect. Thanks, Justin. Um, John, uh, sticking with the topic of mercury, maybe a slightly different sample, but I think it's relevant. Uh, I had an attendee asked, does the L-16 help with the preservation of mercury in environmental water samples? If so, then what is the holding time for samples preserved with L-16? Uh, short answer is yes, L-16 will preserve mercury in environmental samples. However, uh, the reason that acid is often used in, in refrigeration for environmental samples is not just mercury, but other reasons, um, biological growth, et cetera. So if there's a regulation for preserving an environmental sample that you're already subject to, I would recommend continuing to do that uh, in spite of the fact that l cysteine would help with uh, the mercury. Uh, the, the main advantage of the l cysteine is the, is the carryover issues, which you may see in, in um, more oily samples and cannabis related samples. But short answer is yes with l -cysteine. I don't have data on the amount of time though. Um, I can look into that and get back with you uh, via email if that's okay. Perfect, thanks John. Yeah, so again, we're gonna take two, uh, two more questions, but if you've posted a question and we do not get to it live, just uh, keep in mind that all of the questions that were posted will be answered in a complete written form and all attendees will be emailed those and they'll be available for download uh, with the recorded webinar as well. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send a question over to Bob. There was a question about how do you quantitatively transfer a thick oil sample to the bottom of the digestion tube? Do you have a tool or a trick for doing so? Okay, I'll answer this one quickly. I know we're pressed for time. Yes, that's a yes, that's a big problem, and we do have a solution. And what we normally do is we'll put it in what we call a double boiler. So we'll take a hot plate, we'll put some water in a beaker, we'll put uh, we'll actually take the sample in whatever form it's in and get it into a test tube, so to speak, as best we can. Uh, we will then boil it. Uh, well, not quite boil it. We'll heat it to reduce the viscosity. And at which point in time we can then quantitatively take a sample, weigh it, and get it into the vessel. Uh, there's a good tip and trick on that. There's a video on that actually, and I'm going to send that to the person who uh, re did that. It is on the website, but I'll personally send a link. We'll put a link on it for anybody that's on the website on this webinar. But uh, yes, good question, and we do have a trick for that. Okay, thanks, Bob. And I think this is a perfect question to conclude the webinar. Uh, this one is for Rob Thomas. And the question is, how long do you think it will take to see federal oversight of the cannabis industry? Okay, uh, good question, great question. Wish I could answer that. Um, 
Okay, I think it, I think it's fair to say that um, state-based regulations are inadequate. Um, I think what's happened is because there can be no cross-state commerce. So, in other words, um, you, you growers um, of cannabis and manufacturers and processors, you know, cannot sell their products outside the state in theory. But we know a lot goes on. So the question is, um, when is the federal government going to come in? and really you know regulate the industry i think i think it's fair to say that if you look at the pharmaceutical industry um even though it took something like 23 years to go from just looking for one heavy metal lead to eventually regulating 24 elemental impurities um, a part of that process was because the usp and the ich were often in disagreement with what were what should be the list of elemental impurities to monitor? Um, first of all, they started with four, then 15, and they eventually ended up with 24. So I think the cannabis industry is not going to be like that because I think the cannabis industry, even though I often believe it's going in a direction which is very difficult to pull back from, I think state-based regulators will eventually become um, you know, more mature and get to understand the issues more and um you know slowly they're beginning to change and i think probably within two years i think the federal government will come in and you can see that they're that they're involved at this stage now usp just published a a standard method for you know for testing for cannabis so you see signs like this that the federal government is getting involved but uh, you know i just think that the industry is moving so fast at the moment that there's very little incentive to regulate it, uh, you know, thoroughly. And I think the point is that unless the industry slowly begins to change um, and begins to sort of take more notice of things like heavy metals and pesticides, I think is I think it's probably going to take a couple of years for the federal government to come in and you know and attempt to clean the industry up. That's what I believe. Okay, thanks, Rob, and thanks for all our attendees. Again, just a reminder, this entire webinar, including the Q&A session, will be recorded and will be available for on-demand uh, registration in roughly about a week. So if you uh, if you registered for the event, uh, you will automatically get a link, uh, and there'll be a complete uh, Q&A handout that you'll be able to download. And you can also, and we encourage you to, uh, share that link with with your colleagues who might be interested in, in the topic of cannabis analysis by ICPMS. And with that, I thank you for your time and hope to see you next time.